way between our calling and the calling that was on John the Baptist. Amen? Amen? He was called to proclaim the coming of the Lord. Amen? He was called to baptize people and he was called to lead people into repentance. Amen? He was that guy. Amen? And he was chosen even before he was born. Praise God. I mean, how many of you are chosen even before you were born? The Bible clearly says that you were chosen before the creation of the earth. Amen? I mean, you are called to lead the people into repentance. John, in Matthew, and the Great Commission, when Jesus says, go and make disciples, baptizing them. Amen? Just like John baptized, you are called to lead others into baptism and remission of their sins. And again, John was called to proclaim the first coming of Jesus. You and I are called to proclaim the second coming of Jesus. Praise God. Amen. There is a lot of similarity that John has. The mission that was upon John and the mission that is upon us. Amen. We carry the same mission. We are in the, sa the same Holy Spirit that led John to do the ministry is leading me and you today. Praise God. Amen. The same Holy Spirit. And let me tell you, the mission is no different. The mission is same because it is led by the same master. Amen. The mission and the message has not changed. Amen. Amen. The kingdom of God is near. And very soon, it's going to appear among us in a more brighter way. Praise God. It's already here. It's appeared. But it's going to appear in a more beautiful way. Praise God. I mean, you don't have to wait for it. It is already happening right now. And very soon we will see that. As we, when he was a witness, he was the voice that proclaimed in the, in the wilderness. He was the one who pointed everyone to Jesus. And the, he was the one who heard his voice. And this is what God is calling us to be. Amen. As we fulfill his ministry on this earth. As we fulfill God's ministry on this earth. Now, one thing that John spoke, he said, he witnessed, and he's, John records in one chapter 15 of John, John bore witness about him and cried out, this was he of whom I said, he who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. Okay. Now, when I used to read this, uh, when I was small, I used to never like the Gospel of John because the uh, Gospel of John was like, oh, before me, after me, and all these things. But I used to love reading Matthew, Mark, and Luke because it was all uh, showing all the miracles of Jesus and beautiful things that Jesus did. But John goes into a little more deeper way. He just helps us understand what was the mission of Jesus on this earth. So all the Gospels are very beautiful, amazing, records what Jesus did on the earth. It is very much helpful for us. One of the things that, again, John says, he who, this was he of whom I said, he who comes after me ranks before me. Praise God. Praise God. So this is one thing that God does through our lives. When God starts using us. Amen. We have to remember one thing. We are not Christ. We are Christ's representative. Amen. We are not Jesus. We are the ambassadors of Christ. Amen. We are the voice of Christ. We are the witness of Christ. And that's what John was saying. I am not the Messiah, but I am the one who is calling out his coming. This is what God has placed us for. Amen. Calling out the one who is going to come. See, when you go to a place, when you go to a situation, circumstances, wherever you go, a new place, the first thing that people see is you. Amen. The first person, the first people get introduced is you. Amen. The first time they get impressed is by you. Amen. Praise God. We all love to impress. That's what, that's what the world is created about. We all love to impress and we like to make impressions upon people. And that is what we are made for. Every time we go to a place, we are the first ones who is getting introduced there. But in the process as a Christian, we have to always remember and we have to always recognize and understand this mission. This mission is not about us, but it is about the one who lives in us. How do you do that? Once you have got introduced there, once you have spoken there, there comes a point where Jesus gets revealed through your life. 
there is a plan, time that God reveals and shows himself through your words, through your deeds, through your actions, and people see Jesus through your life. And if it doesn't happen, it means there is something wrong in our mission. Amen? Amen, church, this is one thing that we always like to do. And not just that, this is the human tendency. The human tendency is to keep ourselves on the front, keep ourselves in the first. And this is what's happening all around the world. Like if you look at uh, Elvis Presley, Elvis Presley committed suicide when he was, I think, 67 years old, if I'm not wrong. But he committed suicide because he was no longer in the stage and there was a withdrawal symptom. Like, you know, standing in front of a huge crowd and performing was like a huge thrill. It was like a drug. It was like a drug which would give him an uplift. But suddenly he found like after him, there were new singers who came up and there were new people who used to sing better and the world was getting attracted by them and he found no more purpose in living and had to go into drugs and finally die of overdose. Not just that, there's a lot of singers, a lot of people, actors, when they lost the crowd, they committed suicide because that was no longer giving them purpose to live anymore. Because when they found out that they are no longer the heroes, they are no longer the one that people sought after, they didn't find any more purpose. And this is what the world is all about, trying to keep ourselves ahead. Now what's happening? Now all the actors and singers, they have got their own agencies who will keep working for them, who will keep working on their behalf to keep them in the front. Okay? I mean, so don't look at those actors and those singers who are still performing in the front. They may not be there because of the talent. They may be just there because someone is promoting them every now and then. I mean, we think, oh, look at this guy, how blessed he is. Oh, no, he's not blessed. I mean, they are just trying to be there so that they can still have purpose in their life. Josh, I want to tell you, if we are still try, striving and trying and to make more money, to make yourself heard, to make yourself the person, you will be disappointed soon. You will be disappointed because you will come to a point where you will realize there is younger generation that is moving in. There is more youthful person who are coming in, who has more ideas, who are more than to offer than we have. And we will be suddenly disappointed because we have come to a point where we feel that we are no longer needed in that place. I mean, that's what is happening in the world. If you look at the world, what's happening? I mean, children who come up, suddenly we, the elders find out, man, they are good at technology. They just press some buttons and everything happens. I've been trying from morning, but still not working. Amen? And I, I, when I was, my, uh, I was in, I was in, uh, uh, when I was in India and my first son was just like three years old or two years old, I found out he was doing something in my phone and I was trying to figure out how is he doing that. And I had no clue how he was doing it. And I, I had to wait till he does again. So I used to keep waiting, keep waiting, keep waiting when he does again. And finally I found out he was just pressing it two times. I was pressing it one time and I was trying to figure out how does it happen when he does it and doesn't happen when I do it. I found out he used to do two and used to come up. I was like, wow. It was just out of curiosity that he did it. It's just out of fun that he did it. He learned how to do it, but I understand better than him because I have a greater learning than him. Amen? Do you understand what I'm saying? I mean, I have learned more than him, so I understand he can do it, but he doesn't know how to use it. He doesn't have, know the purpose of it. So when your kids, when your kids grow up, they come up with new technology, new, new learning, but it is you who is going to help them understand how to use it. Praise God. Because you were there before them. Praise God. Now look, if, if you use it, you know, uh, the, as we grow up, we learn so many things, and that learning helps us understand things. Like if you were an engineer, you learned so much, and you learned as an engineer, and if I take you to a place and ask you, talk me, tell me about this building, and if you're a civil engineer, you can explain this building very well. But if I take you to an emergency room and try to uh, help you, try to ask you to diagnose a patient, you'll say, no, I cannot, because I'm not a doctor. You can only understand things that you have learned. I mean, the same way if you take a doctor here and try to ask him, 
help me understand this thing or maybe help me understand what's the software problem. He may not be, he may diagnose, he may be the best doctor around, but he will still not do that because he's not learned in that. You will only understand what you have learned. Praise God. I mean, you will only, so you, as your kids are growing up, they're learning it, but you understand it better. They may learn it faster, but you understand it better. They may know how to use the cell phone very well, but you understand what to use it for better. Praise God. So the onus is on you to explain to your child, even when they're learning, even when they look more efficient and more talented than you are. Amen. I mean, church, I mean, the Western culture, I love it. But then there are so many things that you have to put in place. I mean, there are, there are times where the, it happens that when you ha get into this argument with the kid, trying to help that kid understand, trying to explain to the kid, and the parent is like, oh, you will get it when you grow up and just walks away. You will get it when, you will understand when you reach my age and just walks away. They think that it is not a struggle worth anymore and they think like, you know, I don't want to make this a, a situation which is bad looking in my house, looks like dysfunctional. And they leave that and walk away. But let me tell you, church, you were not called to walk away, but you were called to lead them. As parents, you are called to lead them. You're called to help them. You're called to help them understand. I mean, no matter how much they don't understand, you are called to lead them. I mean, you may say, oh, I said it 10 times. I and mean, then if you said it 10 times and still doesn't work, there is still a deeper level that you need to go into. That you need to take. There is a deeper step that you need to take because that is the place where God starts working. I mean, some of us may think, no, 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 I don't want to fight with my kid anymore. I don't want to explain. I already explained it. Okay, if you said in a harsh way, it's time to explain in a softer way. If you just tried the software way, it still didn't work. It is, it's, it's, it's good to try in another way and make things good for him because, you know, understand, because he has learned it, she has learned it, but it is you who is going to discern it and understand it and explain it to you. If you don't do that, what's going to happen? Very soon we're going to have a crisis that is right now happening in this nation right now where youngsters don't understand the meaning of getting married anymore or having children anymore, working hard anymore, finding a purpose in life, but make things like all our life is around Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, and all those things. And let me tell you, it has only depressed the teens even more. Suicides have risen even more. The use of drugs have used even more. And some of the drugs are so bad, that so bad that it can just kill them. And let me tell you, there, if you, if you look back, some, if you read, take of some of the news, news that happened some time back, 16-year-olds losing their life to a drug overdose when they had a promising life ahead of them. And the parents regret saying that, I'm so sorry, I am so regretful that I didn't know my son, my daughter was going through this. They knew how to use Snapchat, but they didn't understand how to make it stop. Church, the call is upon you to help your kids understand what is it. And let me tell you, if, that, if you are not passionate about explaining things to your children, they will get it from a wrong source. And let me tell you, the people who are sitting behind the cameras or the people who are sitting behind the newspapers or these trending things are not in the best interest of your kids. They are just to sell the products and just to make money and they will go to any extent and do anything to make their lives even more luxurious, even it means at the cost of your own child or anyone else. Church, it's time that we take a stand that I am a witness. And let me tell you that starts, starts right from your home first to your children. We can preach to the whole world. But if you lose your own children, what is the message about? That message means nothing. The message has to transform you first. Your children and your family. Then it goes to your neighbors your colleagues, your workplaces. 
your schools, your colleges. It has to be impacted. God has called you to be a witness, to stand up for him. Let me tell you this one more, one more time. If you don't want to take this responsibility and just leave it, let me tell you, 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 can make a, you can show your kid how much money you have made. You can show your kid the car that you drive. You can show your, impress your kid with the house that you have. But they will never understand the purpose behind all that. But if you don't have a car or a house or anything, but if you're passionate about what you're doing, amen? If you're passionate about what you're into, if you show your kid how passionately you work to earn that money, if your kid sees how passionate you were in your life when you were with God, they will, their lives will be passionate. They will get the passion from you. And they will work a purpose into their own lives. Man, praise God. Praise God. You don't need to tell your kid how you made the money. You don't need to tell your kid how much you walked to the school and all those things. Let them see how much you did. Amen. Amen. We know the kids, like, you know, when we're growing up, our parents used to, typically you're coming, if you're coming from Kerala, how Parents said, oh, I walked so many miles. Yeah, but I don't see it now. When I wake up, I see you sleeping. <laughs> now, what I'm, I'm, I, I hope you're getting what I'm saying. There was a time you were passionate about your job because your hunger was leading you there. There was a time that you were doing things because things had to work out for you. And when it finally worked out, if you're staking... If you lost the passion, they will get what you have got right now. They are taking from you what you show and not what you preach. As John was preaching, Mark chapter 1 verses 7 and 8, he goes on to say, After me comes the one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I'm not worthy to stoop down and untie. I will baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Amen? See, listen, John was a guy who had the ministry all going for him. People were just coming to him when we read the portion. The whole countryside came to him. People from Jerusalem came to him. Amen? And this is, he is going on baptizing and baptizing and baptizing. Like, you know, I think like he didn't have the time to preach anymore. The ministry was so much happening. But he's saying, after me comes the one more powerful than I am. And the straps of whose sandal I'm not worthy to stoop down and untie. Church, we follow Jesus in a very good way. Like when we need a job. Or when we need something happening for us and when things have worked out for us how do we treat Jesus still do we still get up with a passion to pray when we have got the job do we still read the Bible when you have already found the best in life will you still go to fellowship as much as you were seeking when you were nothing in your life John says, after me comes the one more powerful than I. Just the understanding of who Jesus is in our life needs to get deeper in our life. The reason why is that if we don't get, you know, what will happen on a Sunday morning, we will still feel, oh, this is the best time for me to rest. Amen. When, when on a Saturday morning, when you are supposed to do the devotions or before your work time, you will still be thinking, okay, one verse is enough for me because that's enough. He knows me. He understands my pain. He understands my struggle. He knows everything. We treat him like someone who is to provide for us. But here is John as he's preaching the message and as he's baptizing and the ministry is going on. He says, after me, there is one who is powerful than I, whose traps I'm not worthy 
a man whose straps are not worthy to untie. You know, Philippians chapter 2 verses 12, Paul says, Therefore, my brothers, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but much now, now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Fear and trembling. What is this fear and trembling? Is it the fear of, oh, I did my sin. I did that thing. I didn't, oh, God is going to strike me now. And he's not going to get things. No, not that fear. The fear of that whom I am serving. He is my master. He is my Lord. And he is my king. The, the fear and trembling of, Lord, he is my friend, but he's still my God. I can come into his presence so freely. I can freely worship him, but he's still my master who holds the whole world in his hands. The fear and trembling. Amen. Work out your salvation because every time we come into the presence of God, we need to come in that attitude of knowing who he is to our lives. Amen. He's not just our provider. He's also the king and the Lord and the master, the one who holds the whole earth in his hands. He's that. Come into his presence with that. Let me tell you, when you start living this way, you know, half of the evangelism that you want to do is already getting done. Praise God. I mean, half of the message that you want to preach is already getting done. The thing is that we don't go into the details of our faith. We just go on. And we always say, oh, that preacher, he's so shallow. This Christian, he's so shallow. I am a deep Christian because I do this, I do this. Church, that is not. God wants us to be the master of our life every moment. Not just when on a Sunday morning. But every time. He wants us to be the king of our life. I mean, as I was saying before, I mean, explain to your kid. I mean, go a little more lower. I mean, Get in one more closer. I mean, if you want to spend more money, spend that money and explain to that kid. I mean, get something. I mean, take them to a take them to somewhere where you can gain their friendship and gain that relationship and make something with them, make a connection with them, show them how much you love them, and try to explain things to them. I mean, you may some of the some of some of us think, oh, if I explain a little, I look smaller in front of my kids. No. No. I mean. Jesus came down to explain the salvation so low that he went to die, to be killed by his own creation. So that he can show the mystery of gospel to us. If Christ could love us so much, how much more we need to love the world. Love our children first. And let me tell you, the more deeper you go, the more lower you go, you feel weak. That's why we don't want to go there. Amen? We look weak because, and we don't want to do that. Because we always want to look strong. We always want to look the good. We always want to look the ideal. In front of, you know, I can look ideal right now in front of my kids. Because my kids, are, kids think I'm a hero. Amen. Because, but once they grow up, they know, like, you know, there are heroes, more heroes. And, like, you know, they will understand who I am. I'm not worried about that. I'm okay with that. So that's why I try to explain myself a little more to them. One day what happened is that I was just getting ready for something and suddenly I turned to the wall and I started praying. So I was standing close to the wall and I was just thinking about something and started praying. And my second son said, Dad, why are you standing there? I said, like, nothing. And he was like asking again, why are you standing there? So mom said, he's just standing there. No, he's, why is he taking a time out? <laughs> and I understood this is a great teaching moment. And then, it had just happened. So I stood a little more, a little more. And he was like, why is he taking a time out? So, uh, and mom said, yeah, that's okay. And he's like, no. So mom said, why? Uh, because, then he said, he, because he is dad. And then, his dad, he only gives time out. He never takes time out. Oh, then I, I after my prayer, I turned to him and said, hey, dads can also be wrong. Amen? Sometimes I need to take time out in my own life to get myself better. I expose myself to him, trying to show him there are weaknesses in my life too, and I'm working on it. And I'm not ashamed to expose myself to him. Amen? Church, this is what Christ wants us to do. Go to a place of your weakness so that 
when you're weak, he will be shown how strong he is. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. Amen. You like to be so strong wherever you are. Amen. You don't want to go into a place where you will be shown weakness, where your weakness will be exposed, or your foolishness will be exposed, or you want to, don't want to look like a fool. Amen. That happens a lot, right? Amen. You don't want to be the person who will open the mouth and blurt out something and everyone will be like, oh God, what's wrong with him? Amen. Or what's wrong with her? You don't want to be the person. And this happened with Paul. Amen. It's not you and just, just let's, let's look to what Paul says. And Paul said in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, 12, verse 9 and, what is it? Okay, let me go further. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 9 and 12, he said, But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made weakness, perfect in your weakness. There was a time where Paul felt so weak, he was tired of it, and he came to God and said, God, can you do something about it because I'm tired. I'm weak in this place. I need strength. And one of the greatest mystery and revelation was showed to there. God said, my grace is sufficient for you. Amen? Amen. A verse that we quote over and over again for our weakness but then let me tell you, church, it is not just a weakness that you have in your life. It is a weakness that you're exposed when you step into the world, when you step into the vulnerable. He said, like, oh, therefore I will boast even more gladly about my weakness so that Christ's strength may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weakness, in insults, in hardship, in persecution, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am Praise God. Praise God. Church, till you get weak, the world will not see the grace of God. Amen? Amen? Till you come to the point of your weakness, because till then the world is seeing you. How strong you are, how good you are, how efficient you are, how wise you are, and the world praises you. Amen? And you're good standing there. But come to a place of weakness. And the world will say, hey, see, he is weak. He is foolish. He is dumb. But I know there is greater who is inside of me. Who will rise up in time of need. When I'm weak, he is strong. And this is what I should happen. I must decrease and he must increase. If he has to increase, then I have to decrease. My level has to go down. He has to rise up. And if he has to rise up, I have to go down. I have to go to a place of weakness. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. What does Ephesians say? Amen. He God raised us up with Christ. Ephesians 2 verses 6 and 9. And he seated us with him in heavenly realms. With Christ Jesus, in order that the coming ages he might show his incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Why did God raise us up? So that we can be rich and famous. Everything goes for us. That's what we think. But there is more to that. Unless you let the grace of God be seen through your life. Amen. What does Paul say? He seated us in the heavenly realms with Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages that he might show his incomparable riches of his grace. Amen. Incomparable riches of his grace. And when will that be shown? Only when I'm weak. Amen, church, when, uh, some of us may be thinking, oh my God, what is this weakness that I'm talking about? Get into Paul's life. Get into any man of God's life. Paul was saying, amen, he went to the place and he was preaching. He was a wise guy. He was a wise guy. He was a learned guy. And he was preaching the message. And there were times that he was rejected. He was insulted. He was mocked. Maybe like, you know, if we were there, what would have we thought? God, it is a good time. Let me go back to Jerusalem and sit there as a believer. Amen. Or let me go back to Philippians church, which is really happening. I love the church because the Philippian church listens to me all the time. When I preach a message, they are so good. A man, he could have done that. But no, he used to go to a new place. Talk the gospel to a new people. Talk the message to a new people. Because he 
was weak. And you know what he said? When I'm weak, that's when he's strong. You know, I stand here in this place of weakness when I'm preaching this message to a new person. But when I'm weak, that's when he's strong. I mean, when I'm insulted, when I'm persecuted, I know he's strong. When I'm down, when I'm getting beaten up, I know someone else is getting revealed. You know, I'm getting beaten up right now. Amen. And they put me in the prison. They put my feet in stocks. And they put my hands in chains. I mean, we sang the song today morning, break every chain. Let me tell you, ask you a question, church. What chain are you talking about? Is there any chain that is holding you right now? Everything's free, right? Just step into the mission field. There will chains come on your hands. Chain, step into your place of weakness. Chains will come on your hands. Step into a place where God can use you and where you cannot do it by yourself. Chains will come because the chains of the world will pull you back when you start stepping into the place of mission of God. And if those chains have not come yet, that song doesn't make any meaning to us when we sing on a Sunday morning. Because that song is another song which we sang last Sunday or which we sang a month ago. And we will sing it again and will make no meaning to us. But unless you get into a place of weakness and you start singing, oh, when the strongholds hold you, amen. The strongholds hold you. Maybe you're sharing your gospel with your child. Maybe you're sharing your gospel with a neighbor. And you are like sharing, sharing. And it has not happened. Maybe you have been rejected in places where you thought like they will accept you. But the chain is still holding you. It's not letting you go ahead. And the message is not getting passed on. Let me tell you, that night when Paul and Silas were sitting there. And they have sang that song, break every chain, praise God. And the song really came in to happening the foundations moved praise God praise God the song really made sense when he sang it when he was in chains and then the foundations moved there were some foundations that were held to keep Paul there but that very night that Jesus appeared and the foundations moved the chains were broken not just his chains everybody's chains were broken praise God praise God Church, God is calling us to a mission, which is his mission, not your mission. A man which is his name, not our name. He's calling us, to a, a, calling us to something that he will do through your life and not what you can do through your life. Praise God. Praise God. A man, that is what God is calling us to. And that is what God is calling us to. A man, thank you, Jesus. Church, let me tell you one more thing. Our prayers that we prayed, our songs that we sang, and the message that we have preached, if it is only coming from our flesh, it's time to take it to a next level that is into your spirit. And God is faithful to do it. He is faithful to do it. Because there are times that you run out of prayers, words to pray. There are times that you've quoted every scripture and you still find lacking. There are times that you preach the message hundred times and that person is still not changed. But when Paul writes to the Romans, he says, Romans chapter 8, verses 26, the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. In other scripture, it says, words that cannot be uttered groanings that would not be uttered by in your flesh church is time to take our mission to the next level you have done enough with your flesh you're preached enough with your flesh you have spoken and sang enough with your flesh and you're tired of it but it's not time to give up amen it's not time to give up, but it is time to pray even harder. It is time to preach even harder. It is time to seek even more deeper because there is a mystery hidden in that weakness which is not revealed right now to you. But as you start praying in the presence of God, there will rise a prayer out of you and that will not be in your flesh. That will come from your spirit. Praise God.
There will be a message that will come out of you. That is not coming from your flesh, but will come out of your spirit. There will, be a, there will be a deed that will come out of your spirit. And when it comes out, the world will see Jesus. And they will come and tell you, hey, I no longer see Stanley. I no longer see you. But I see something else in you. And that something else is not you. And that's when you open your mouth and say, it is not me, but it is it is Jesus that is speaking through me. It is Jesus that is praying through me. It is Jesus that is working through me. Church, if you want the world to see the real message of Jesus, you need to come into a place of your weakness. You need to come to into a place of your weakness. Because in, his, in your weakness, His grace will be revealed. His grace will be revealed. It's not your work. It's not your job. But it is the job of the Holy Spirit. But as long as you're holding on to it and you wouldn't let it go, He cannot take over. Church, it's time that we let go of the controls and ask Him, God, would you take over? I'm tired of it. Would you stand to your feet, church? If you're in your room right now, in your house, would you stand to your feet? Come into his presence and say, God.